All right, everybody. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the conversation with Carrie, and we've got people now moving from room to room as we have this conversation with Yale Hochberg. Yale is, to me, like the most interesting academic looking at entrepreneurship. A handful of folks that I read the stuff they do, and I think, man, like that makes me better as a VC. That makes me better as an entrepreneur. That makes me better as someone who's tried advising people to do this kind of stuff. She heads the entrepreneurship initiative at Rice University. She's also the academic director of the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. She's probably best known to the audience here. And you may not even know her, but you certainly know the work as the person behind the seed accelerator rankings. So for those of you who are local and every couple of years see an announcement from Alpha Lab about where Alpha Lab ranks, or if you're in another part of the country or the world and you're seeing where your local accelerator ranks. That work is being led by Yale and her team. And it's definitely important work I do want to get to. But she also co-founded a consulting firm called Flywheel Innovation, which helps corporations and tools promote and cultivate corporate innovation. That's what we've been talking about a lot over the last six days. And we've had Alexander Osterwald and Steve Blank speak yesterday. We had Seth Godin talk earlier around it. I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of weave in some of your thinking around that, and then we'll get to some of the other stuff. On the Flyway Innovation site, you talk about adapting this work from your ESI research, your Entrepreneurial Success Initiatives research. Maybe as a place to get started, let's talk about what that research is, and then we'll talk about how we've customized it for Flywheel. Sure. So to tell you about, you know, to tell you about Flywheel, I do have to tell you about ESI, but to tell you about ESI, I have to take a step further back, which is, Great. I think you'll relate to as um, someone who's also an educator. Here I am, I'm a professor who's teaching entrepreneurship. And one of the questions I get asked all the time, and certainly got asked for many years when I started teaching in this area, was, can you actually teach entrepreneurship? Aren't entrepreneurs born what are you really teaching? Either they are entrepreneurs or they're not. And, you know, my answer for this for many years and still today is, look, I, I can't give someone passion. I can't give them a, a fantastic idea born out of either their experience or a problem that they're facing or, or something that they're seeing in the environment. What I can do, though, is if they have the passion and they have the idea, I can give them better tools to be right. successful. So, you know, I can increase the chance that from an execution perspective, they'll be likely to succeed. And anybody who's engaged in anything that's related to entrepreneurship and innovation knows that, you know, knowing what you don't know can be very, very helpful in that scenario. So, you know, all of our education, kind of the curriculum at Rice and the programming we offer is sort of designed around that. We don't just stand there and tell inspiring stories, go find your, your passion. We actually teach tools and frameworks that have been developed by us and, and others, my colleagues at various institutions. And the thing is, is that what research there is on the efficacy of entrepreneurship education has not really found, in academia, we tend to call this mixed results, but the reality is they haven't really found that entrepreneurship education has been particularly effective. But the reality is that the way that these things are tested are not doing a really good job of testing the same notion of, can we teach tools and frameworks? There are these big scale studies where they recruit people who are sort of from unemployment lines or at bus stops and say, here, I'll give you some small business training from the SBA. It's different everywhere you are. Oh, it doesn't seem to make them more likely to start a business. Well, they weren't inclined to, to begin with. Sure. And it certainly doesn't tell me if it's going to make them more successful if they were inclined to. So what we wanted to do was actually do something to say, okay, is this effective? And my underlying gut feeling was that it was because I feel that the accelerator programs, um, you know, we'll talk about that later, actually doing really good things for startups. If you have a well-designed program, with a well-designed education, a well-designed training program and a well-designed mentor program and so forth. So the Kauffman Foundation was gracious enough to fund a what is now a four-year study. We are literally collecting the last survey as we speak, so I can't tell you results yet. But for this purpose, what we did is we went into co-working and incubator spaces across the U.S. and enrolled over 600 startups in a study where they committed to giving us access to key data for uh, a period of years, um, in return for which half of them were randomized into a training program. And the training program was designed around this principle of let me teach you to know what you don't know, and let me teach you tools and frameworks to have a better chance at success. And this was what we called the Entrepreneurship Success Initiative. And we had a little over 600 startups that have been participating in that for the last four years. You know, I think without having fully analyzed the data and without being allowed yet to tell you what we're going to find there, it was clear to me that these kinds of programs can be very effective. 
And then I started working with large corporates, thinking about corporate accelerators and innovation programs, and realized that a lot of the problems that they were encountering, a lot of the issues that they faced, actually had a lot of similarities to the issues yeah. that the startups were facing. You know, how do I think about stakeholders and how do I think about the process of customer uh, discovery and figuring out a value proposition and, and how do I work in these uncertain environments? And Flywheel Innovation was kind of born out of the work that we were doing with corporates here around Houston and elsewhere in the U.S. And it wasn't that difficult to think about what parts of that curriculum that we had developed for ESI would be relevant for corporate innovators or you know, for startups going through a corporate accelerator or for innovation teams that are working on internal ideas and so forth. And that kind of the connection back to the entrepreneurship success initiative. That's awesome. I'm thinking back a little bit to the conversation yesterday with Steve and Alex. And I do think we were doing customer development in startups before I read Four Steps to the Epiphany, right? It wasn't like he wrote the book and I'm like, oh, talking to customers, like, that's a really good idea that I never would have thought of before, right? But I think part of this also on kind of teaching these frameworks is they also give us vocabulary to talk about these things. All of a sudden now, it's not like customers is important. It's like, okay, well, where are you in this four-step customer development model? And I think some of the stuff he's now doing around kind of creating new vocabulary for corporate innovation is really important. And he made a comment yesterday, which is like, he's spending more and more time on corporates because he kind of feels like the startup entrepreneur framework part of this is kind of solved for. And now he's really excited about the space that's not solved for. And that's certainly something just in my own work that I'm finding as well. It's like, there's just a lot of fertile ground out here of innovation that needs to happen. I guess when you think about Flywheel relative to the other things you're doing, I mean, you could stay busy doing a lot of different things. Like what made you want to kind of start working with these corporate innovation? groups. Yeah. So the interesting thing about moving down to Houston is just how many Fortune 100, Fortune 500 multinationals there are down here. And as part of the work I was doing at Rice and, and you know, it's head of the Rice Entrepreneurship Initiative, some of the things that we're trying to do to engage with the Houston community, we started this corporate roundtable for corporate innovators. And it was just amazing to hear these same things coming up over and over and over again and to realize that they really I think it's like you said, there was no shared language, right? There's no shared vocabulary, but, and yet what everyone's describing is the same. They're all hitting the same snacks. They're all hitting the same problems. They're facing the same challenges. And I always felt like these round tables were like sort of group therapy sessions for everyone around. Oh, it's not just me, right? I like, but the frustrations are, are all very similar and have, you know, a lot to do. Part of it is I'm trying to get my internal innovation teams to do this new thing and to develop these new ideas. And they're so used to working within the corporate hierarchy with siloed disciplinary functions. And how do I get them to sort of move past that? And how do I get them to think about strategy that when it's not corporate strategy at at the large scale? And so some of those things were very similar to the ESI piece, but it's also the case that just understanding how do you build these ecosystems within the corporation to support things was something that they were all struggling with. Right. Like, what should that look like? What do I need to have in place? Why am I hitting these snacks? What's the culture that the cultural issues that I'm facing? Where essentially are the roadblocks that we need to tackle if we want to actually be successful? Because I think companies, as a general rule, large multinationals understand that you have to do innovation in order to succeed. Right? I don't need to tell anybody who's listening to this talk, and certainly not you, that if you just look at turnover in the S&P 500 and how that's changed in the last 50 years, you see these massive companies dying at an insane rate, right? It's the process of disruption and creative destruction has just accelerated tremendously. You may have been doing the same thing for 100 years and it's all been great, but 50 years or however long it is. But if you don't look at who's coming up on the right-hand side in the rearview mirror and you don't make sure that you're out there thinking about the threats that could potentially take out your business or looking at how converging trends might completely change what your business is, you're going to be in trouble. But I think a lot of corporations don't know how to effectively do that. And they engage in what we call innovation theater amongst ourselves at, at right. Wheel. But at the same time, they want to be able to succeed, right? There's a sincere desire and just a lack of knowledge and a lack of frameworks to think about this. So how do we translate the frameworks we've developed for entrepreneurs and for venture capitalists and so forth into frameworks that the corporate innovator can use? And how do we help them figure out how to tackle roadblocks in the organization and deal with the stakeholders and convince the stakeholders and slowly but surely change the culture and the direction that needs to be going? 
I want to get to that culture, but we're going to, I'm also going to pull in the questions from the audience as well here. So Sue Cohen from Pitt has a question, not the Sue Cohen that you, <laughs> I, was, I was realized I was saying that like, she's going to think I mean her colleague. Georgia. Sue Cohen from University of Pittsburgh has a question for you. Uh, do you have a model or a framework for constructing internal innovation ecosystems that define the stakeholders and their roles? Yeah, I think these are frameworks that are definitely evolving. And by the way, Sue, if you ever want to talk about this, I'm super happy. I can go on about these things at length uh, you know, over a Zoom call. But you know, what we really think about is sort of this overlaying Venn diagram of leadership, people, and process and structure. Right. And if you want a successful and repeatable innovation ecosystem within a company, you've got to have all of that working together and not just middle management, but executive leadership needs to be aligned and have support for the goal. They have to be committed for the long term and truly committed for the long term. You have to have a clear definition of what innovation actually is for you as a corporation, which I think a lot of corporations don't have. And you have to have really clear goals. And those goals are often very different for different corporations based on where you are on the market. And then from a people perspective, you have to think about dedicated people who are responsible for developing the innovation and about the rewards and the incentive system. And how do you give the implementers an entrepreneurial mindset and skill set? And then how do you set the corporate culture to actually want to see this change so that it's not just sort of a thing you're doing because we pay lip service to it, but actually something where you believe that you're going to be rewarded in the corporation and the corporation is going to value what you're actually doing. And then process and structure is about funding processes. It's about clarity around how go-no-go decisions are made. It's about making sure you have access to those resources and making sure that the you know that those are coming from places where they're not fighting other people's incentives around their P&L. What are the metrics that you're going to have for success? And are they clear and are they aligned right across the organization? How do you access external networks and innovation? So there's a lot to unpack in there. And I think there's still a lot of work for all of us to be doing. And I think this is probably part of why all of us are excited to think about this. It's like you said, I could spend all my time on the accelerators and that would eat up my life. And, And I could spend all my time writing research papers and that would eat up my life. But this is, I think, an interesting new place where the potential for impact is just tremendous. And if I just think about corporations we have here in Houston in the various industrial spaces and so forth, and just what they could be achieving with better innovation ecosystems, you know, the chance for impact on the world is in some ways much higher than for the average entrepreneur I might start working with. There's no doubt. I mean, we kind of preach you to the choir, but that is 100% how I feel about this as well. This one came, in, and this is probably partially because I've been talking about this a lot over the six days, but getting to that funding conversation, yeah. you know, how do you think corporate should manage the risk of these higher risk bets like MPV, IRR, or something else? You know, it's interesting. I was doing a session yesterday with a large multinational that we will leave anonymous that was having quite a bit of struggle around these things. And one of the points that was brought up by one of their innovation people who's stationed in Silicon Valley was that their big challenge is the difference between the contrast of profit and value. And that when you have systems that are set up where you have to fund these projects from within the business units or business groups, and yet their goals are short-term IRR and the decision processes are, are set around are we going to hit these benchmark IRRs that we have for projects in our particular silo and so forth? You often can't make a new technology or a new innovation project hit those profit requirements in the short term. But if you look at the long-term value of these things, there's often great long-term value, especially if you think about sort of standard technology S-curves that you know, came out of McKinsey and so forth around just how disruption happens and how technology is developed. You have to look ahead to what's going to cannibalize what you're doing right now. But if you're worried about short-term profit, you're never going to get those things off the ground. So I think the corporations that I see as having been more successful at this are the ones who say, okay, I'm going to dedicate a budget to this. I'm going to actually fund this out of a separate pot of money. I'm not going to put this on my business units. I'm going to bridge to my business units because that's super important. I need to be working on problems that are truly relevant to my business or that cut across or adjacent to the things I'm doing. But I can't rely solely on an SVP, a particular group being a saying, okay, I'm going to find you some money out of my budget where I'm probably getting pressure for cost cutting all the time and trying to figure out how to make more pe- my people more productive at doing what they're just doing. If you do that, then the innovation processes often just sort of stop right in their tracks because nobody wants to make those big initial investments. But if you want them to happen, you have to have that, that money sitting somewhere. Yeah. So I think there's the the outcome piece you're talking about. There's also just the arithmetic of it. 
right? Like IR and NPV expect a certain distribution of outcomes that probably doesn't match well to innovation. And then I think your sort of portfolio pipeline to the business units is like really, really important there. So, you know, as mentioned to this audience, even if they don't know you, every single person on here knows your rankings. It's kind of become a, a meme to itself. And maybe to some extent, I might argue That's even a self- or a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. And I think potentially there are some negatives to it. Think about business school rankings, to be yeah. fair. But I think it's mostly a good thing and certainly helpful for entrepreneurs. I guess with this sort of flywheel hat still on and thinking about the seed rankings, I guess what circumstances do you think it makes sense for a company to launch a vertical accelerator, either on their own or to call up our friends at Techstars and do it with them or whatever the case may be? Depends what you want to do. This is why actually knowing what your goals are is so important, right? right. So if, if what you want is to simply have some set of company executives or, or you know, middle managers or engineers, or whatever it might be, have some exposure to new companies that are out there, you don't necessarily have to set up your own accelerator. You can simply have people go and volunteer as mentors at you know existing accelerators in those verticals. There's, a, I, I'd be shocked if we can find an industry vertical in which there's not at least half dozen accelerators these days, no matter how narrow or how crazy you might make the vertical. I'm pretty sure there's one out there now. If, if not, there's a BD group in Boulder working to <laughs> that one up. So probably, but uh, it depends. What, again, so it's sort of what your goals are, and, and if what you so if what you want is to get people sort of excited about the notion of new technologies. I think the best thing you can do is go out and just sort of get plugged into the existing ecosystem that's already there in your industry vertical. It doesn't have to be in your locale. It just needs to be in your vertical. Send your people to the demo days. Send your people to be mentors. You probably have people with a lot of valuable expertise for various startups out there, and that's great. If what you want is to start giving opportunities for startups to beta products that you think might be valuable for the strategic goals of your business, if you want to be really, really close to a small group of startups that you think have, say, the potential for you to acquire or the potential to be your customers, then you're starting to talk about, okay, should I launch my own accelerator program where my people work very closely with those startups and where we think about the right structures and the right incentives so that the people with the most interesting ideas for me come to my accelerator in your car company and you do something around, you know, what's the future of connected cars and try out a bunch of technologies and figure out in great detail how to solve problems around intellectual property and so forth. By the way, the solution to that is you leave that to the startup and you buy it later if you want. And then there's sort of the middle ground. I think the middle ground is it's sort of, I want a little bit more exposure than just having people be mentors or I want the startups to recognize me as someone who supports innovation and wants to work with startups. And then I think you've got all the sort of powered by type things where you go out and you get somebody run an accelerator that has your brand on it and do your best to sort of showcase what your company has to offer as a partner, but sort of can leave maybe the day to day of trying to, to help the startups along to people at Techstars or whoever the organization might be. So it really sort of depends what you want to achieve. I mean, it's the same with you can set up a corporate venture capital group that's job is to bring you financial returns, or you can set one up whose job it is to fund technologies that are going to help you in the future of your business. It's yeah, what you want to achieve. Yeah, I totally agree. And I want to get to CVC in a minute, but just I guess what before we leave that, any corporate accelerators that you're really impressed with and why? I'll give you one example and I could probably give you a lot more, but I think if you look at my, the Microsoft accelerator, the Zach Weisfeld chain of those accelerators, I think that's a great example of Microsoft achieving a really great goal for itself and also building a program that really helped startups. So Microsoft didn't build that because they wanted to force people on to Azure or anything like that. So this is different than the Microsoft Azure accelerator right. the Connect Accelerator and so forth. But this was, you know, a set of accelerators was born actually out of Microsoft and Israel with the goal of changing Microsoft's image from we are a dinosaur that no startup wants to come anywhere near to no, actually, Microsoft is really cool and has really innovative people and people who really helped me understand my business, even if I'm running off of AWS. And I think they did a really good job with that. And they brought in a lot of, of really great people to work with the startups. I know Zach has recently left. I think he's about to go do this for maybe it was Intel. I'm not sure. But another technology company here in Houston, actually, is one of their first oh. ones. So that's been kind of interesting to follow. I actually but, did not know he had left 
Microsoft. That's interesting. So this is what I was. Uh, this Breaking was news. Old, early. This, I, <laughs> sorry, Zach. I'm pretty sure it's on his LinkedIn. So okay. I don't. All right. I don't think I'm letting anything uh, out of okay. the bag. But thinking creatively about, you, know, you have to design for for what you want to achieve, and yeah. you know, it's not. The, the th there's never a one size fits all template, and part of this is you have to think about what is the environment in which you're operating and what you ultimately want to achieve within that environment, and that makes it not as simple as simply saying, why don't I contract with someone to have a corporate accelerator? Yeah, cool. Last question on that. Uh, this comes from right around the corner from you, actually, in Waco, Texas. So John and at Startup Waco wants to know, how have you best seen outside public-private partnership organizations help facilitate the connection between entrepreneurs and their corporate innovation labs? That's a good question. It's tough to say what the best practices are there, but I think Part of the challenge is that a lot of corporations don't know how to work with startups. And I think a large part of what some of these private public partnerships can do it is really engage in an education effort, right? How should I think as a large corporation about what it's going to mean to start sourcing from small startups, right? So first of all, how do I connect to them? I think running reverse pitches, helping the corporate innovation groups connect to startups that are working on things that they're interested in or technologies that might be beneficial to them. That's sort of stage one. And then stage two is helping them understand that you can't spend six months negotiating a contract where every two weeks you change something because there's another person who has to approve it. While in the meanwhile, the poor startup who can barely afford its lawyer is dying for lack, A, for lack of cash flow, and, and B, for bleeding out every time you're like, oh, but I forgot to CC John last time and now John has comments. So it went right back into the legal department and now the contract's coming out and it's like, not, and not anywhere similar to where it was. So you have to figure out how to change procurement processes and, and lots of other things to really facilitate some of this. And I think we all can kind of contribute to smoothing that over with you know, just some education around things and helping facilitate those connections. Yeah, in terms of that first phase, by the way, right after this, guys, we're announcing exactly one of those. So Neil Sony, who literally wrote the book on companies and startups working together helped us this year do one of those sort of challenges we're announcing that at 2.30. In terms of CBC, I do want to come back to that. So we had Joseph Cabral moderate a panel earlier in the session, which was awesome, with Touchdown Venture, Samsung, and Optum. I guess first questions, you kind of started to go down there even a little bit on the accelerator question. Like, How do you think companies should think about if and why they should move into CVC, and then similarly, any CVC groups you're particularly impressed with? You know, I think if you want to do CVC, quite honestly, your best bet is to do it because you have strategic goals, not necessarily because you have financial goals. I think it's important to separate those two things out. And I think if you, especially for the ones that, that start with goals of financial goals, precisely because venture is a J curve, and it takes so long to get to results, and Corporations are not very good at thinking about long-term horizons versus short-term horizons. See previous conversation about profitability and IRR and trying to start innovation projects, right? I think there's some research on this from Josh Lerner and Paul Gompers that admittedly was done sort of back in the first internet bubble slash boom as you yeah. see it. But I think that research and research that's followed has pretty much indicated the valuable CVC programs are the ones that think about the strategic goals of the corporation. And that means thinking about windows on new technology. It's thinking about what am I going to potentially acquire, want to acquire in the future. If you're an entrepreneur, cover your ears. It's thinking about what technologies I want to quash because they might cannibalize me or direct in other directions. And there's a lot of different ways to think about it, but the strategic goals, I think, are really key to that. And it doesn't mean that ultimately you won't see financial returns. The other thing is, I would say, don't start a CVC arm unless you're willing to commit right off the bat to 10 or 20 years. Right. Because the biggest thing that you see over these cycles is we open a CVC arm and then, and usually we do it at the height of some kind of market cycle, and then everything drops and we it's all cost because we haven't seen the returns yet. You don't know how to measure the strategic returns. So somebody from above, the executive leadership or new CEO shuts it down. And at the bottom of the trough, all those things get sold off for parts. They probably actually do really well in the long term. But by the time you're back, you're like, oh, we're back at the top of the market buying it every single time you're in a four years and you just lose money. And that's, I think, a painful and, and unnecessary cycle. So commit to it for the long term. 
figure out what your metrics are going to be for strategic goals and accept that they're not going to be short term. They're going to be longer term. Set up the right incentives. The other thing is, I think, is the big challenge with CVCs is just figuring out compensation for the people who are in them. And this is another reason why having strategic goals is, is useful rather than just financial goals. One of the big challenges that you have as a CVC is that if you're looking for the person who's going to get you the best financial return, that person will be picked off by a private venture firm within two to three years, maybe four. And because you either have to figure out how you're going to give people proper pieces of the upside, which in many corporations is very, very hard to stomach, or you really want to think about this as a different skill set than your private VC is thinking about. It's about the connection to the business and the strategic goals and, and how I achieve those. Yeah, I do think that's where some people experience with these new models like touchdown become interesting, right? Because it sort of breaks that apart a little bit. You know, it's interesting on the patient portion of this. I had Josh on the podcast a couple months ago, and I was kind of thinking it was interesting because you're right, that work came out kind of early 2000s, like, and then this sort of like, stay with it in 2008, right? But like a lot of his new stuff, like patient capital, as someone who also raises just normal funds has been an incredible resource on like dumb and pension funds, that kind of thing. And it, it, like, I think a lot of those lessons actually translate back to that corporate group as well. Like you yeah. need to have that kind of long-term her- patient capital time horizon. If you're going to go down this, this yeah. path. The other way you could do this, if you want as a commitment device is you become a single LP in a fund And But you make that fund external to the corporation and set it up with a proper limited partnership contract and make sure that you're basically saying, okay, this is patient capital. It may not be coming from my pension fund, but it's definitely not. I can't suddenly decide I'm shutting down the budget line three years. I agree. I do wonder, speaking now as a GP, I would never sign up for that, right? And that's where I wonder if like these touchdown models become interesting because they have sort of this hybrid where like, Nobody wants a single LP because then you have a boss, right? If you have a bunch of LPs, then you have a family of investors, right? And I do wonder if that becomes challenging, but certainly people have done that. They've done the the solo LP and and made that work. In some ways, I'm surprised we don't see more um, companies within the same industry coming together into a single fund with a, a dedicated GP whose job it is to find things that are not necessarily the core things that they compete on, but the stuff that is the periphery that helps make their business safer and better and so forth that they would all be buying from the same entities. Whether it's, you know, if you've got workers on oil rigs, the training headgear, the yeah. construction, you know, the clothing, the safety rigs, all that stuff. I'm sort of surprised we don't see more of that kind of structure. I could not agree more. Like, I think that there's some real opportunity there. And I think the sort of way you justify that is sort of the Intel capital justification, right? Like Intel makes a bunch of investments. A lot more microprocessors are built based on the things they invest in. Pi raises and Intel feels pretty good about what their share of that bigger pie is going to be. I think you could do that in a lot of sectors. And I actually think that could be pretty financially lucrative and do some really interesting things for the industries for what it's worth. So. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about some of your stuff at Rice as, as well. So as you said, you know, there's a lot of Fortune 100, 500, a lot of big companies in Houston. A lot of them are in the energy space, obviously. I don't think that's news to anybody. And so I imagine you've kind of gotten a front row seat at innovation inside the energy sector. How do you think innovation is similar and different there versus some of these other industries we've been talking about over the last six days? I don't know that I would say it's specifically something that is about energy per se, but I think one of my observations is there is a big difference between thinking about innovation in a large technology company, you know, even one that that builds hardware versus innovation in the industrial space or the energy space where the decisions you make, the components you use, all this stuff, there's human lives that are that are kind of on the line, right? There are massive safety issues that are on the line where you really have to be thinking about things that go well beyond will this actually sort of work, but also will this potentially lead to a massive explosion of my chemical plants or a machinery chopping off someone's fingers and, and so on and so forth. And I think there's a lot of resistance from corporate executives and corporate innovation folks in these kinds of company around sort of and defensiveness that I think is somewhat 
justified around this notion of like, don't come in here and give me the Silicon Valley model. The Silicon Valley model of rapid iteration doesn't work when if I rapidly iterate on this prototype and there, the screw is like a little bit off, something might explode, right? And it's not... Oh, not it's, a lot of move fast and break things. Oh, it is not software crashed, right? It has yeah. real implications. And I think that, I think you have to understand these things and you have to understand the concerns that they have. Because the truth is that the frameworks still work but they do have to be adapted, right? What does iteration actually mean? And what point do you say, okay, I can test again, right? And and maybe you can't do sort of lean in its traditional sense, but you can think about, okay, what's an adaptation of that? What can I, you know, what can I iterate on quickly? And where do I have to stop and say, okay, before we can go for any further, this has to actually go through a very different kind of process. Yeah. So I see this as well, by the way, in how we think about entrepreneurship education more generally and in things like the NSF i you know, where we've basically imposed these tools that were developed for like rapid software development on people who are doing hard tech and it doesn't work in the university commercialization setting very well. And I don't think it works in corporate commercial in sort of corporate innovation settings either. Right. So it is different in that sense. You A need to have a much better understanding of the environments that these people are working in and the constraints that they face and the regulatory constraints that they face. Just like you know, you can't treat healthcare the way that you treat a software startup, right? It's different as well. So there are definite industry differences. And it's kind of amazing how often you talk to a, a large energy company here and they talk about bringing in ECGDV or McKinsey to try and sort of set up their innovation processes. And ultimately, you're like, well, this doesn't work because they don't get the risks that we actually face and the, and the constraints that we operate under. So I think that stood out. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's actually just quickly do healthcare, then I want to get to a couple other things. But you also teach the healthcare innovation class at Rice. And uh, I imagine that class is different today than it was in January of this year. It's like, how do you think about healthcare innovation changing because yeah. of COVID? You know, the interesting thing is that and maybe this is going to be a controversial statement. I think if anything, the healthcare innovation stuff doesn't change as much because, hmm. you know, whereas I think a lot of our startups who are in other industries are sort of facing more scrutiny and more of a crunch around funding and questions around how does this work in a world where we're not interacting in person and so forth. At least with the companies I've been working with, the medical stuff hasn't changed as much. And most of my companies are also working on medical devices for the most part, to some extent, digital health. And we teach them the biodesign process and that hasn't changed much. At the same time, now, I do have former students who are working in this area, and I think there's just been a big, if you're already in it, there's been a big speed up. How do I adapt my product in some way? How do I take what I'm doing to make it more relevant to the environment that we're in right now today? And I guess the good news is, is that the funding is still there, and that's, I yeah. think, the constant that, that's been a savior for all of it. It's, it's good to be in ed tech and telemedicine right now, <laughs> is my observation as a VC. So. We've only got a couple of minutes here. I did want to finish with just a couple of questions about the things you're excited about because you sort of, and this is rather than just corporate entrepreneurship. Now, just generally, like you're kind of one of the people who has their pulse on entrepreneurship research. In that broadest sense, what are the areas you're most excited about today? A lot of the stuff that I've been doing in recent years has been focused on one of two things, and certainly the things that I'm most excited about doing right now, one of two things, either how do we build better ecosystems to support startups, right? Yeah. And that's a big one. Like, if you want to start an entrepreneurial cluster, what's the right thing to do? Is it to bring, to say, let me start a seed venture fund that I fund out of you know, economic development funds? Or is it to take that money instead and work on figuring out how do I support or translational research and commercialization out of the universities and labs that I already have in the location. And some recent work that I just put out as a, a working paper actually suggests that our emphasis on start on sort of plunking funds down, you know, if we put money there, the innovation and the companies will come is actually completely wrong. You have the innovation stock to begin with. There has to be something for it to invest in that's worthwhile. And maybe we should be putting our public dollars towards actually figuring out how to support getting more stuff out of the labs, out of the universities, out of the hospitals. If you do that, by the way, what the data show is that the private money will flow to that innovation, right? And you know this as an investor. If there's a good opportunity, you're going to come for it. And yeah. if you can find one that everyone else is overlooking, even all better, right? Better. Yeah. Yeah. 
so I'm doing work in that direction that I'm, I'm very excited about because I think we have lots of work that says this kind of thing can possibly be good, but not a lot that compares cost benefits of if I have a dollar, which one of these many so-called good things do I put it in that's going to have the most benefit and how do you kickstart cycles? So that's one area that I'm really excited about. And then the other one is just understanding you know, sort of what the drivers are that and the contours that shape people entering into entrepreneurship. Why do we see so much entrepreneurship in certain areas and not in other areas? When do people start businesses? What kinds of sort of environments make them more likely to be willing to take risk versus not? So we wrote a paper recently just looking at like how the gig economy has affected things. Just the knowledge that, oh shit, if this doesn't work out and I can't get my old job back, at least for a couple of months while I'm searching for a job, I can, I can drive for Uber. Turns out that's really, really important in driving people to be willing to take the jump of saying, okay, I'll go do this. Or I'm not making money for the first year or so. It's okay. I can drive on the weekends. I can at least pay my rent, right? Factors like that actually sort of use the entry is another area that I'm really interested in. Yeah, That's awesome. Okay, last question. I always kind of exposing folks in here to interesting academic researchers, right? And so I guess I'm curious, a couple professors that you think people should be aware of today and maybe not only just who they are, but why you think people should be interested in their work. If you haven't read things by a guy named Matt Marks, I would go look. He has a really interesting portfolio of things in the strategy area. He's at BU, everything from issues around startup teams and founders to just understanding how ecosystems, how the startup world works. Guy's a whiz with data and he's look uncovered a lot of really interesting things. If you're interested in the venture capital world, uh, there's a guy named Michael Ewens over at Caltech. And I used to be at Carnegie Mellon, by the way. I should probably say his name is actually Michael Evans, but if you want to search for him, it's E W E N S. So I'll say Ewan's for everyone else. But Mike's great. And Mike has, I think, one of the deepest troves of venture capital data that anyone on this planet has. So those are two people I would definitely take a look at. Yeah. Mike's awesome. He and I spent a lot of time in his office when he was was at Tepper. I forgot. He he was. And for those of you who are maybe thinking, like, that sounds interesting. The correlation ventures work that most of you are familiar with yeah. makes a lot of the thinking behind that. John wanted to know that work you just referenced. I assume your working papers are on your site. Is that true? Um, most of them are. Some of the newer stuff is not quite there, but on my list for things to do this weekend is to update my site. So hopefully, yes. Uh, <laughs> also, you can also email me. It's last name at rice.edu. And I'm always happy to send copies of my papers to anyone who wants. You can usually find them on the National Bureau of Economic Research website as well, or on the Social Science Research Network. If you just search for my last name, just about every paper I've ever written, including the new ones, should pop up. Okay, cool. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone.